Good morning, um, everybody, to our participants um, from the United States. Um, good afternoon um, to all our participants um, from Germany and from Europe. Um, I'm Stormy Miltner. I'm the director of the Aspen Institute Germany in Berlin, um, and it is my very great pleasure welcoming you all today um, to our fourth state-to-state um, -state, um, event. Um, this is part of our series, um, which we are doing together, um, Aspen Germany with the American Council on Germany. Um, and uh, Steve Sokol, Steve, thank you so much for doing this together. Um, and um, we are very much looking forward to the discussion um, today. Today, we want to look to take a closer look at the relationship between rural areas and uh, urban areas. But what this whole dialogue series is about is um, getting, getting together and discussing um, what's going on on the sub-federal level um, and learning from each other. And this uh, is why we want to make this as interactive as possible today. Um, we have wonderful speakers, but we don't want to make this a speakers only discussion, but we also want to hear from our audience, um, at least a little later on in the discussion. Until then, I would like to ask you to mute um, your, um, to mute yourself so that we don't have that much background noise. But later on, we want to hear specifically from you um, and not just through the chat function, but we would also like to really hear from you and call on you. Um, I'm looking forward to um, an exciting discussion round and Steve, um, I hand it over to you. Um, thanks so much for doing this with us. Well, thank you, Stormy, and welcome to everybody. Um, Stormy, on the part of the ACG, it's just a delight to work with Aspen again um, on this series and in general. And I wanna give a special shout out to your colleague, Deepka Wattenberg and my colleague, Rob Fenstermacher for doing a lot of the legwork to pull these sessions together. Um, these have been wonderful discussions that we have, so, have had so far. And we are looking forward to another great discussion today. Um, as I was saying in the green room before we went live, um, there are often atmospheric disturbances between Washington and Brussels and Washington and Berlin. And both Aspen Germany and the ACG have felt that it's extremely important to focus on the subnational level, what's happening in states, um, what's happening in cities, and how can we strengthen the ties between Germany and the US because um, many communities in both countries are facing some of the same challenges. I'd like to remind our viewers that um, it would be great if you could mute yourself because we're hearing a little bit of background noise uh, and we want this to be as clear as possible. Um, so today we're gonna talk about the urban rural divide and about infrastructure and about how states in both Germany and the US are tackling these issues. Um, let me maybe set the stage a little bit uh, both the United States and Germany are trying to, to rebuild and rejuvenate their economies as we come out of the pandemic. And there's been a strong, invest, a strong focus on investment in infrastructure as a way of giving our economies a boost, um, as a way of creating jobs. But we've also found that the pandemic has highlighted and indeed in some cases exacerbated some of the shortcomings in infrastructure that exist in both of our countries. It's also exacerbated the urban rural divide. Um, prior to the pandemic, while many metropolitan areas were able to surge forward, more rural areas and even some low income urban areas um, were hit by demographic decline, loss of jobs, uh, rising poverty, lack of investment, and poor infrastructure, both in terms of traditional infrastructure related to streets, bridges, buildings, water systems, as of course seen by the crisis in Flint, Michigan, and transportation, but also as we've all been hearing, broadband internet connectivity. And so it is urgently needed that um, states, um, cities in both of our countries focus on these issues and and make a big investment and try to close some of those gaps. So before I introduce our panel and before I, I, we dive into our conversation, 
Um, Stormy has some interesting statistics that help shed light on the urban-rural divide that she'd like to share with everybody. Thank you so much, Steve. And I have to say, our audience was very disciplined in muting themselves. It was me, um, the background <laughs> noise. <laughs> Um, and indeed, I would like to share a little bit of data uh, with you, um, and we can also post uh, the data in the chat function in a second. Um, unfortunately, data on rural-urban divide is hard to come about, um, and that's kind of also already the first um, finding we would like to follow up on later on um, after um, our discussion, that there needs uh, to be more updated data. Um, and some of the data I'm going to present is from before the crisis and not uh, from uh, 2020. But let me just share a couple of um, data points with you. So the percentage of people who live in urban and rural areas in the United States, it's 83% in urban areas, 17% in rural areas. Um, and for Germany, it's, 70, it's uh, almost 78% uh, in urban areas and rural areas, 22%. I don't know if you're surprised by this. I was a little bit surprised. I thought that the urban population would be even higher in comparison to rural areas. The second um, thing we looked at is um, income and income distribution and the income gap between rural areas and, um, and cities. What we found for the US is that the uh, medium household income for rural areas is uh, around $52,000. Um, and for urban areas, it's uh, $54,000. Uh, so it, it is a little bit higher. Um, and for Germany, we didn't find comparative data, but we found data on um, average daily wages. Um, and there is quite a difference, um, uh, 121 euros per day uh, for urban areas and 99 euros for um, rural areas. So there is, there is actually a, a difference. Then we looked at poverty and un unemployment rates, um, and there the relationship is reversed. For both the US and the EU, and you will see that in chat function in a second, um, the poverty rate in rural areas is slightly lower than in urban areas, and unemployment just the same. For rural areas, it's slightly lower um, than for urban areas. Interestingly, we also looked at dropouts for high schools, um, so kids who leave school without um, a degree, and what we find is, again, higher in urban areas um, and lower in rural areas. So what I tried to, uh, we also looked at broadband and road transportation. So in the general eye, a lot of times we are focusing, uh, or we, we, I, I think we are thinking that everything is uh, better in, in urban areas than in rural areas, but that's not always the case. We also found that there are great divergencies between regions. So these are national averages, but there are huge differences from state to state. Um, and that is something we now want to take a closer look at um, to shed some light um, and getting away from the aggregate data to take a look at qualitative um, experiences from different states. And back to you, Steve. Thank you so much, um, Stormy. I think that's a great way of, of setting the stage. Um, let me now introduce our, our panel. Um, we have uh, three great guests with us at the moment and a fourth guest who will be joining us momentarily. Um, Ellen DeMuth was first elected to the state parliament of Rhineland-Palatinate in 2011. She's a Christian Democrat and currently serves as vice chair of the Committee for Digital Affairs, Digital Infrastructure, and the Media. Herzlich willkommen. And Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks for having me. We are, we are delighted to have you. Um, Philip de Kuna is a social democrat and has been a member of the State Parliament of Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania since 2016. He serves as spokesperson for energy, consumer protection policy, as well as for digitalization and network policy for the SPD parliamentary group. And so, Philip, uh, herzlich willkommen to you as well. Steve. And next is Jerry Sonnenberg. He's a Republican who was first elected to the Colorado House of Representatives in 2006. He is a Colorado native who's been farming and ranching in the northeastern part of his state 
for his entire life. And I thought it was interesting to read in his bio that his voice has, of course, been in strong support of rural Colorado. And so um, with our three speakers today, we have representatives from states where there is um, a heavy focus on, on rural areas as well. But Jerry, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. We will be joined a little later by Democratic Senator Teresa Ruiz from the New Jersey State Senate. She was elected uh, in 2007 and she has a previous commitment, but she uh, will get here as soon as she can. Um, let's maybe start by reflecting on some of the statistics that Stormy talked a little bit about. Um, she said it was hard to find data on the urban rural divide. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing from each of you as representatives uh, in states where um, there is a, a major rural part of the state, whether you also find it difficult to find data on the urban rural divide in your state and whether you were surprised by that opening statistic that Stormy mentioned of in the US, 83% of the people living in urban areas and 17% of the people living in rural areas. And in Germany, 78% in urban areas and 22% in more rural areas. Um, Jerry, your mic is on, so I'm going to go to you first and ask you if if you were at all surprised by these um, by these numbers, and then go to Ellen and then to Philip. Uh, well, thanks, Stephen. And actually, no, I'm not surprised by those numbers. Those numbers uh, uh, typically play out, and I think uh, leads to that urban rural divide in the in the legislative process. Uh, where uh, votes are, uh, or legislators are uh, split up based on population. Um, and there's uh, essentially, well, for example, my district, my rural district is about 21,000 square miles, uh, which I believe is about 55,000 square kilometers. Uh, uh, and so, it, it's a very, very large district. It's actually larger than nine states in the United States, my Senate district. We have approximately, well, we have five rural legislators uh, or senators out of 35. So I suppose that fits that uh, narrative pretty close, the 17%. And then the rest are all urban legislators, which... Uh, uh, often uh, when they represent their district, um, kind of ignore uh, or, or the issues that affect us in rural parts of the state are not on their forefront. And so the, the discussion uh, becomes a challenge. And, and so, yes, I'm not, uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, that's kind of the way it fits here. And that makes, I think, it a challenge for all of us rural legislators. Thank you, Jerry. Ellen, um, same question to you. Were you at all surprised by, by these numbers? And picking up on what Jerry was saying, um, rural issues are often ignored by colleagues from more urban areas within his state. Is that something that you see playing out in um, rheinland Palatinate as well? Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I'd like to jo join uh, Jerry with his answer because I'm not surprised either. Um, in my state, um, we would be a good average of what the numbers played out. Um, it's true, lots of people live in the urban areas uh, rather than in the rural areas. Um, in my state, we, we have uh, 4 million inhabitants. And um, we live in the countryside of Germany. We have beautiful wine regions with wine growing, rural areas with um, um, farmers everywhere. So um, it's not surprising. And in the parliament, I'd say more legislators are from the countryside as well. Um, so it's the way around. Um, cities uh, need to be heard in parliament rather than the rural areas. Um, uh, yeah, voices for the rural areas are really strong in my state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Philip, um, what about you? Any, any surprises uh, by these numbers? 
not really surprised about the uh, numbers either. Um, in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, it's also we have more um, parliamentarians uh, from the rural area uh, and not from the urban area. Um, it's um, something a little bit is a little bit of the history of our country because since 1990 we have um, um, much people going away. Um, we have uh, much of the people. Uh, most of the um, rural area who, who left our, our country, who uh, our state, going to cities like Berlin, Hamburg, and and more. And um, now we have the problem uh, to um, take all the infrastructure and everything uh, up living. Um, what, uh, but it was designed for much more people. And um, when we look back, um, it's uh, like um, we are testing everything in uh, big cities. Uh, when we look at public transportation also, it's uh, much easier to design new things uh, for big cities. Berlin, Hamburg, we, we, we're talking about um, much uh, things like car sharing and um, some other um, techniques. Uh, we can't. We we are not able to um, put them in the rural area because here are so less people, and it's not easy to design this new techniques um, for yeah countryside. Thank you. I'm I'm glad that you brought up um, the issue of of public transportation um, and you know some of these new models uh, where cities are often sort of the petri dish, the place where experimentation takes place and. What works in a city might not work in a rural area. We obviously see that playing out mm -hmm. elsewhere as well. But because um, infrastructure has been such a buzzword in US politics and in Germany over the um, past couple of years, I'd like to, to maybe sort of help frame our conversation by asking each of you to share with us kind of a short definition of how you look at infrastructure and what should be included when we think about this topic. Obviously, for many people, it's things like bridges and roads, but because of the digital divide that we've been talking about so much after the, the last 15 months, um, that digital infrastructure becomes important as well. When you think about infrastructure in your state, um, how do you how do you define it? And and Jerry, why don't we let you sort of kick it off, and and we'll we'll go to Ellen and then Philip as well. Uh, absolutely, I and mean, quite honestly, it depends on who you're talking with on what that infrastructure includes. Uh, but I'm not sure you can exclude anything when it comes to the infrastructure because it all kind of ties together. You obviously talk about the roads and bridges. Uh, when, it, when it comes to roads and bridges uh, in rural areas of my state, the vast majority of money that is spent is spent uh, uh, along the metro areas to shuttle people or to create highways uh, uh, and widen highways. Uh, we have trouble in Colorado utilizing public transit. Uh, uh, for some reason, uh, it's, it's whether we're so spread out, uh, whatever the reason, uh, and whether it's the mountains that uh, don't allow us to go to the west uh, very easily, uh, that becomes an issue uh, on the roads and bridges. You talk about uh, uh, internet uh, uh, that type of infrastructure, uh, obviously rural Colorado, and I'm sure it's the same, for companies to be able to invest in rural areas, uh, it becomes much more expensive because there is so little population to pay for that investment. Uh, and, and I would argue that lend, tends to lean over into our healthcare as well, and, and, and an infrastructure with regard to healthcare facilities, uh, hospitals, doctors, and then utilizing telemedicine uh, in rural areas. So uh, it all kind of ties together as an infrastructure, but I think those are three components uh, when it comes to infrastructure that have to be discussed on a regular basis. Thank you, Jerry. Ellen, what, what is at the top of your list when you think about infrastructure? 
Yeah, I think infrastructure is crucial when it comes to the quality of life for my state. So, um, I yeah, Jerry said a lot. That's really correct. Um, it's really important to have um, a good infrastructure when it comes to broadband and internet quality. Um, that's a problem in my state, I have to admit. Um, we need to increase our broadband quality. We're not doing good over uh, everywhere in Germany. Uh, compared to other countries in Europe, we need to really increase the speed and um, the level of infrastructure. But um, apart from that, we need good infrastructure with our roads and bridges as well. Still, because a lot of my people commute to bigger cities and regions, um, to Cologne, uh, to Frankfurt, and it's really important to get there quickly in the morning and not uh, yeah, stand for hours on, on the motorway. And um, yeah, in addition, of course, a problem is um, uh, the quality of service in, um, in, in medicine and in, of course, schools as well and um, kindergartens and um, also um, homes for elderly people. We need to, we have not enough um, to guarantee that women can work everywhere as they can do in bigger cities. So that's a topic we often talk about in parliament. Thank you, Ellen. And, and Philip, um, let, me, let me come to you as well in, in terms of the definition of, of infrastructure and what's important for Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, Western Pomer Pomerania. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, grab the, the quality of life. Uh, I think it sounds really good. And in Germany, we have a word, it's like a Daseinsvorsorge. Uh, it's like the service of general interest. And um, I think all this um, is um, contained in the infrastructure. And um, I, um, I, I agree to Jerry, who said it's... Um, uh, it's up to uh, who you are talking with. And, in in, and here in the state, in Germany, I think it's uh, much of all this with roads, uh, rails and bridges, but also the water supply, the electricity with the power lines. Uh, in my state, also ports, uh, because uh, companies want to um, trade with other states and um, around the global, um, but also the supply of broadband and the digital uh, parts they come up in the, in the last years. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And let me welcome Senator Teresa Ruiz, who just joined us as well. Um, we've been talking a little bit about short definitions um, of what infrastructure means to you and what's important in each of the states that are represented today. Uh, Teresa Ruiz, would you like to, to weigh in on that and just jump right in? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Or I'm not sure what the time frame is all around the world with all the participants are here. But hola from the state of New Jersey. My name is Teresa Ruiz and I'm Senate President Pro Temp for the state of New Jersey. Infrastructure, as we know, right, we already heard water quality issues of that we were dealing with here in the city and probably at, on a national crisis, lead lines, pipes. Um, but for me, focus through a lens of education, infrastructure always comes down to some basic principles. Um, schools that meet the 22nd century demand of curriculum. I still have school buildings in my district that were built under the Abraham Lincoln administration that have kids coming into the school buildings. Um, in infrastructure, in the lens of the pandemic, for me was access to broadband and computer equipment for all of our families who had to navigate their classrooms now from technology inside of the household, that not every single one of my families had it. Um, so I, 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 I tend to look at infrastructure slightly different than the traditional kind of, you know, roadway, bridges, pathways, which is all critically important to making sure that, that our families have accessibility to get to the resources needed. But through the lens of education is access to universal preschool, access to uh, maternal health care uh, connections, access to resources so that the child can meet their 100% potential in our classrooms, um, and just making sure that connectivity across the board, not just from a roadway, a waterway, or a bridge, that connectivity to resources from a government perspective is lent to every single one of our families, regardless as to what zip code they live in. Thank you, Teresa. If I may, um, let me follow up with a direct question to you and, and one that I'd like to pose to the others as well, which I've not posed yet. And, and that is, okay, if you were going to grade the infrastructure in your state, in New Jersey in this case, 
on a scale of one to 10, with one being the best and 10 being the worst, what would the overall grade of infrastructure be? Um, and what would you say are the top two deficits where investment is needed the most? So, I, so I'm going to give us a terrible grade. I'm going to go 9.5. I won't go all the way to the extremity of the 10, but I, but I think that there has been national. I think there's been state research on our infrastructure, and it's not has nothing to do with any administration's. Um, you know, so it's not a condemnation of any one administration. I just think it's it's a com it's it's something that probably is very atypical of all the states in the country, right? That our infrastructure. When budgets are pressed, these are the things that get put aside. What are the things that they feel like can least get attention to? And it's roadways, bridges, waterways. I think for us in the state, the number one priority is making sure that our that our water is safe. And so there has to be a, a complete focus. And I think we're going to see that moving in, in the next year's direction, making sure that our water is lead free so that when we're opening our you know, taps in our households, People can cook and can drink, um, you know, and and feel uh, safe and making sure that we're safe with that. And then, secondarily, right, our roadways need massive improvement. Um, but but again, from the ed space, I would say we need to build our schools. And so I, I you know, I I look at it from which I know what's probably most needed, but then I look at it from a selfish perspective as the chair of the education committee we are in dire need of building new schools throughout the state that are equipped with the necessary resources to meet the challenges of today's needs and to make sure that our children look, when we think about um, access to HVAC systems and air conditioning, we can't move to a 300, if we wanted to move to a 365 day school year, we could not do it in some districts because we don't have air conditioning in the schools, which is ridiculous to me that we're a first power country and we still have facilities that don't have modernized HVAC systems. Thank you. And I, I'm glad that you put such an emphasis on schools because it seems to me that, that you know, when thinking about infrastructure, part of what we're thinking about is the immediate, um, our roads, you know, better transportation, but part of it is also the future. And if we don't have the investment in education, we won't have the workforce of the future that we need. I always, look, you could ask me every question you want, Steve. I'm always going to go back to Ed because if, if, if we make the investment early on and you have a well-rounded taxpayer, then you can eliminate all the other services at the latter end. And I want to tell everyone, I was a little bit, my schedule was crazy today and I apologize for getting on late, but I didn't want to miss this opportunity because right before the pandemic, I had a great uh, experience to talk to the ambassador from Germany at the time and I can't remember the name. And I just, I will tell you, you all probably think that you need to do a lot. I will tell you from someone who's looking from the outside, uh, you know, in your um, uh, maternity leave, it is, it is an extraordinary thing what you do for women, uh, it, you know, in the country and how you elevate women during that process, not only giving them the time off and, and giving them opportunities for childcare and going back to work so that when they come back, I'm just in awe of it. And I think there's a lot for New Jersey to learn from what Germany has done to support women and children in different spaces. So that's my own PSA. Well, Teresa, thank you because that totally underscores the reason why Aspen Germany and the American Council on Germany are doing these kinds of events because we want to find areas where we can learn from each other and where we can collaborate with each other. Um, I'd like to, to go to Ellen DeMuth um, from, from Rhineland Palatinate next with, with the same question of, of how you would rank um, your state's infrastructure and what the top two or three issues are that you find yourself focusing on or that you think the state should focus on. Thanks, Steve. Um, I would rate my state maybe with a seven or eight in total infrastructure. Overall, um, really important in my state, as I said already, are very good roads and motorways. And it's really important because many people commute to other states. 
And we really have to work on that, but that's an ongoing problem. After every winter season, we have to renew our roads, build bigger roads, and we need to build more um, roads for bicycles because more and more people go to work by bike in Germany. That's really popular right now. And my state is lacking of um, extra roads for all the bikes and e-bikes. And in addition, of course, we need um, a good broadband and in internet infrastructure. Since um, Corona told us that many people work from home and this is going to increase in the future. And I always tell um, my people in my constituency, uh, when we look back in a hundred years to what my generation did politically, it will we will be rated by how quickly we built um, broadband infrastructure and digitalization and how well we cope with this uh, transformation. If we do not work on it and um, do it quickly, we will lack and uh, stay behind other countries and other states and people will go to um, uh, urban areas and leave rural areas because they cannot work there anymore and cannot find jobs. So that's the most important topic we have to focus on. Thank you. And I think when it comes to that sort of brain drain, um, that's something that Mecklenburg Western Pomerania knows something about. And so, Philip, would you like to, to let us know what score you would give the infrastructure in your state and what the top issues are? I would also give like a seven or eight. We have uh, in the last 30 years um, since our state exists, we uh, in invested much uh, in all the streets and um, also the federal streets like the highways and uh, also our own our um, state streets. It's a little bit separated uh, in, in, in Germany. Um, but also we um, need something like bicycle ways all over the country. It's um, this is not uh, so good because we want to build them next to the big streets, next to the main streets, and um, that's not working all fine because all of all the uh, preparation and um, all uh, the agreements with the owner of the of the um, 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 flächen in, in German. Um, the space, the open space. The, the, the space around the streets. Um, but also the um, railways uh, are very good when you think about the main railway, uh, railways uh, between um, the big cities. Next we have Hamburg or Ber Berlin. Um, These um, railways are very good, but um, all the secondary uh, lines, um, we um, have no investments in the last years and um, that does not work. And so we can't put any traffic on this um, secondary um, roads or ra railways. Uh, so it's, uh, it doesn't uh, work. And um, the, the digital infrastructure, it uh, was like um, one of the worst um, when we think about um, five or six years ago. And now we have a federal program to invest in this uh, digital infrastructure but it takes time. It's like five or six years now. Uh, we work on this um, topic and we want to build fiber optics because uh, we um, have a, a, a problem in all the little villages. We have only a little line with um, telephone and it does not work with internet uh, so much. And it's also the problem with uh, the schools and um, the um, other companies in the rural area. And now we have like working for five or six years to put this fiber optics with this federal program and it works. And now we are uh, putting always bet between, this, uh, between the villages like a big fiber optic uh, um, pipes. And now we have the uh, option to put into every household in uh, Mecklenburg, Western per Pomerania um, fiber optics. And so we want to make a um, jump to, to the next um, yeah, a digital uh, way. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Jerry, let's let's go to you in Colorado. Um, what what grade would you give infrastructure in your state, and what are the top um, two or three issues? Well, and, and uh, thank you. I I'm going to have to go with uh, President Pro Tem Ruiz, uh, and uh, she gave a nine and a half. I was trying to find some positive so I could do a nine, but I'm going to stick, I'm going to stick with a nine. It is, uh, it, it's, 
the infrastructure in rural parts of the state is absolutely horrendous. If the low grade is a 10, we're probably at 11 or 12 when it comes to the internet and uh, uh, broadband. Uh, for example, I just did a speed test uh, while I'm here and I'm under four meg per second. And, uh, you know, that's actually probably reasonable out here. But my grandson is with me and I, he can't be on the internet. Nobody can be on the internet. So I don't lose connectivity with you in, in the bandwidth. Uh, when, when Teresa was talking about schools uh, during the pandemic, that was a huge issue for us out here because many of the residents don't have access. And then there's parts of this state that you can't get internet unless you go satellite. And many of the people who live out here can't afford uh, satellite. So trying to educate those kids during the pandemic, we saw a heightened uh, awareness of the lack of broadband, uh, lack of internet access, and how some students were being uh, left behind during that pandemic. Uh, many schools made a number of different uh, changes and actually paid for uh, some households to actually have internet so they could be helpful. Uh, when it comes to the highway aspect, uh, we're always gonna be left. Uh, we have more lane miles of highways, uh, roadways in rural Colorado and we're gonna get on the short end of the stick simply because that rural uh, urban divide, that population is on the front range and they're demanding that uh, those roads accommodate the vast majority of the people in, in, in my state. Thank you. So I'm hearing from all of you that the level of infrastructure is really not very good in any of your states, um, that Infrastructure is uh, a little bit better in the two German states that are represented today than in the two US states, um, but that there are some real challenges ahead. Um, and I'd like to unpack some of these challenges and, and dig in a little deeper, particularly to this, this digital divide and the lack of broadband and digital infrastructure um, in more rural areas, but also in some inner city areas, because that is a, a big problem. But before we do that, um, I want to remind our viewers that we would like to take questions from you. I've started to get a couple of questions and comments in the chat. Um, a, a couple of hands have gone up. There are two ways to ask questions. One is through the chat, and the other is, of course, to, to raise your hand, and I will call on you. And since Stormy has her hand up, I will call on her first, uh, hoping that her question has something to do with what we're talking about at the moment. <laughs> You're lucky it has. Um, uh, coming to or picking up on the issue of digitalization, which we also discussed in one of our previous um, meetings, um, digitalization offers so many, I mean, potentials, but it's also, also with regard to energy and, uh, and climate uh, and climate protection, but it's also very energy intensive. And um, if you look at uh, data storage centers, for example, Rechenzentren, they use an enormous amount of energy. A lot of times in Germany, those are located within inner cities. Um, and now there is a discussion if it wouldn't make sense to move Rechenzentren data centers to areas where you actually have a lot of energy supply. Um, so to rural areas where you have a lot of wind energy or solar energy, to use the energy which is there immediately um, for um, data processing, data, um, data storage, um, and so on. Um, the requirement for this is, again, infrastructure investment um, in, 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 in new uh, data centers, but also in broadband um, and fiber optics, uh, which then connect those areas with the cities. And I was interesting, interested in learning, uh, learning if this is something which is discussed in your state um, as a potential, um, and um, if there are actually already um, developments in that direction. So maybe as a footnote to that, let me bring uh, Teresa back into the conversation because I think in your bio, it says that you recently sponsored 
a bill that looks directly at the digital divide and it's um, an attempt to create something called the Broadband Assistance Office in the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Can you talk a little bit about the proposed bill and what you hope to, um, to achieve through that? So a, a lot of the policy that I put forth during the pandemic um, doesn't it wasn't necessarily uh, have to get placed as far as becoming law, right? It was really to elevate conversations in spaces where I thought um, <clears throat> no one was engaging in it, you know, making sure that that children had access to computers, et cetera. So I, I'm, I'm not so sure that this will become law, but this is an initiative that we are going to be pursuing at the state level. The focus is to think about uh, what is it that we do when we open up a, a, a roadway. Every time one of our roadways along the highway in the state of New Jersey gets opened up, there is no reason for us not to be laying down the infrastructure for broadband in those spaces so that we are maximizing. You know, one of the levels of frustration that I have is that locally I work for county government and when we set our minds to do something, we get it done. When I drive the the um, turnpike to get down to the state house, the, the stereotype of government, instead of being a bridge for families and it becomes a bureaucracy, right? And so I feel like there's a lot of common sense level approach to getting these issues navigated if we just did more seamless initiatives. And so I feel like this would be a seamless initiative, setting up an office that really does a, a, a data collection of where the issues are, really drawing a blueprint up uh, for the state of New Jersey, where is the need, coordinating with any public works initiatives, whether it's on a local level, county level, or state level, when, when roads are being ripped up, how can we make the investment at the same time to lay down the framework? so that everybody has access to broadband. And then globally, just talking about what is the future of the internet and why are we paying for it to some degree, right? Like, why are we paying for access to something that I, I feel should be accessible to everyone at a whim? And so really having those discussions, because when I look at my bill, and I don't know what it is in Germany, it's, you know, people pay anywhere from 80 to 100 up US dollars for the monthly access to broadband. And um, I had issues. The, the, one of the best stories was I was doing a national morning show news from my house talking about technology and broadband and my internet went out. So I could only do it via the telephone. And I'm in a major metropolitan area, which indicates that there is still the need for improvement. But I'm, I'm fortunate and I'm resourced. What happens to the mother who's a neighbor of mine that is using the internet via their, you know, a lot of people when they switch thought that they would be able to use their phones, right? How are we gonna navigate this whole workspace for our kids and not really recognizing the need to have greater accessibility to a more um, infrastructured uh, household in the sense to having access to technology. So Teresa, maybe as a quick follow-up and it's then- It's Teresa, to to by the way, Steve. I'm sorry, Teresa. Sorry. sorry, Teresa. My parents didn't um, speak English, so it was Teresa, but I won't have you roll the R's. I don't think our German friends will be able to do that either, so. Well, <laughs> Teresa, um, I'm sorry about that. I will I will try to It's okay, it's okay. Um, and then um, let me ask a follow-up to you and then and then go to Jerry for another um, US perspective to, to sort of get at Stormy's question. But I guess the, the core question I have for you first is um, with the introduction or proposal of this bill, um, do you, f and with other efforts that you and others are making, um, do you feel that there is a greater awareness about this issue and that Absolutely. this needs to be addressed? Absolutely. So I know the focus of this is not really the pandemic, but a lot of people ask me um, what, okay, can you tell me what has been the key core point of COVID-19? I said it lent power to my agenda, right? So people who were not talking about these issues before, learning loss, um, you know, students being left behind, access to technology, access to broadband, connectivity to infrastructure, became now a touch point for every single policymaker, regardless as to where they lived, or what socioeconomic demographic they were representing. So yes, the conversation has been elevated. And I think what's greater, at least for us here in the state, and, and probably the same narrative for a lot of states in the country, is that the federal stimulus money that's coming in is giving us really a one-time opportunity to get off of the hamster wheel and reinvent ourselves governmentally to do these kind of like um, infrastructure vaccine programs, academic vaccine programs, 
uh, you know, uh, em, you know, employment vaccine programs. Let's really, really figure out how we can use these funds to do a one-time shot to get the best return on, on our investments. If we don't do that now, then we're just going to keep repeating the cycle of what we were doing before, which we know is, you know, um, you know, just functioning in a space of lunacy. There's really a one-time opportunity now that the conversation has been elevated and everybody recognizes, regardless to what geographic location they represent, to really put our money where our mouth is and make those investments in real time in infrastructure. And I say that across the board, not just roadways, pathways. When I think about even transit, right? And our conversation here in New Jersey about creating the, uh, the tunnel into the city, which is finally now happening happening when we talk about the country and you know the justice 40 infrastructure bill that's being discussed on the federal level and the opportunity that that's going to afford each state and this country to really elevate our spaces um, since that we haven't seen in, in decades thank you so so Jerry let's let's go to you and hear sort of your take from from Colorado I'm sorry Steve I I was listening uh, to Senator Ruiz, and and now I don't remember what the question <laughs> was from Stormy. Can can Stormy re kind of short version refresh me, please? No, no, sh no, sure. I was um, asking if there's any discussion of moving um, big data centers to rural areas to use the energy which is in higher supply there than in the inner cities. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, thank you for uh, uh, helping with that. And, and we're doing that to some extent. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, that the connectivity, the uh, the uh, uh, wiring uh, is not uh, in place to be able to uh, help connect. Uh, the entire state. So we can have those data centers in rural parts of the state, as long as it's next to an interstate or a major highway where we have the access or the easement to be able to put the fiber in the ground. Um, the, the problem is that uh, uh, then you get out to rural parts of the state and all of a sudden, you're having trouble finding workforce to be able to support that type of data center. Uh, people may not want to live in that in a rural area. Like uh, I'm two hours from uh, uh, from a major uh, the major city, so uh, many people won't move to a rural area to be part of that labor force. Uh, we have tried uh, to put money to develop that infrastructure to try and move much of the, the data centers, much of industry outside of a metro area to try and help distribute uh, uh, the population and the workforce uh, and quite frankly, uh, help with uh, the rural areas where maybe the net income, household income is less than our urban cousins, uh, but we've struggled at making that actually happen. Thank you, Jerry. I'd now like to, to go to Ellen and, and Philip and, and talk uh, a little bit about this problem from, from a German perspective. Um, you know, obviously we've, we've all touched on the digital divide a little bit, the lack of broadband and digital infrastructure. Um, I think Teresa's point um, about an increased awareness is a very important one. And I'd be curious to know if you feel that there's an increased awareness uh, about these issues in Germany but also if you think that um, the closing the gap, closing the digital divide uh, will be a greater priority moving forward and whether funding will be available um, from the federal government, but also at the state government. As Philip pointed out before, this is a topic that has been discussed for four or five years, but there doesn't seem to be as much progress as people would like to see. Ellen, perhaps you first and then, and then Philip. Yes, sure. Um, yes, Philip already mentioned uh, that we have special programs to um, promote um, more infrastructure in that um, um, field. 
um, yeah, the problem is um, the money is given to the state governments and there is no plan between the state governments um, to put more pressure into uh, the build a rebuilding of infrastructure. And therefore we need a national initiative to solve that problem um, in my, out of my point of view. And as long as we do not have that initiative and we have an own ministry in, in uh, the government that uh, overlooks all um, the infrastructure building, um, there won't be enough pressure in that system to focus on it. And that's um, a key um, a key we need to use. Um, maybe to your point, Stormy, um, uh, from my state, um, there wouldn't be an option uh, to put any uh, strong um, um, electricity or power using um, plants or centers in the countryside because we do not have um, enough renewable energy yet. Um, our main focus is on building enough um, uh, renewable energy systems in our country and then there could be in the next next step um, move these centers to the countryside. Uh, my state is um, not close to the coastlines where we have much strong wind energy. Um, in my state we need to focus on hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen or um, solar power and a little bit of wind energy but it will be a long way until we have as much as renewable power to um, yeah, have big power using infrastructure. Thank you, Ellen. F Philip, what about Mecklenburg for Poma, Western Pomerania? Yes, uh, in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, we uh, do not have so much data centers, um, and so we can't move them to the countryside. Uh, we have only some state uh, owned and um, however we have very good power lines here all over the country also in the rural areas um, um, we have invested in in this in the last years very much because they uh, were 1990 um, in, in a very bad condition and we had to do this and now we have w one of the best and in a, a global um, comparison, um, we have one of the best um, energy networks all over Germany because on the average we have like 12 minutes power off um, all over the year and, uh, uh, and it's uh, very less because, all, uh, be because of all the renewable energy we have in Germany, we needed to upgrade our, powers, uh, our power lines, our energy network. And so we have an intelligent uh, network and um, so we have uh, also, uh, yeah, it's a, it's really good. But um, and uh, first is the good part. Uh, Mecklenburg Western Pomerania has much uh, renewable energy. It's like I think two hundred percent of the um, power we need. Um, um, we have um, with wind and solar and offshore. But in Germany, it's a little bit tr tricky with the energy prices because in the calculation, um, most of the investments we did to uh, bring all this wind, solar and offshore in the network, uh, all the people in this area where the uh, wind um, energy mills are, had to pay for this um, new lines. So the people in the rural area has to uh, has the highest energy price all over the world here in, in, in Mecklenburg, West and Pomerania, it's uh, we have in the last year a good competition. It's a really high energy prices because of all the renewable energy is produced here. Uh, because we have to build all this uh, last mile of uh, networks for the energy, and so it's a little bit tricky. And because of this high prices, uh, no da data center would come uh, in our uh, region. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. So I'd like to, to maybe fold in um, a comment from, from one of our, our viewers. Um, obviously, we started this conversation talking uh, in a little bit more depth about the urban-rural divide and some of the, the trends in urban areas and in rural areas. And um, one of our viewers uh, says that, that that split between urban and rural misses a key point. Um, and he points out that lots of the growth that's going on, at least in the U.S., um, but I think it's true in Germany as well, over the past decades has been in the suburbs um, and that populations in cities have shrunk while populations in the regions around cities in the suburbs in the Speckgürtel uh, has grown. 
and that it's the suburbs where one sees a lot of economic dynamism that one might not see in city centers and in completely rural areas. I'd like to ask each of you maybe to, to comment on what's going on in, in sort of some of the suburban areas uh, in your states and, and maybe start with you, Teresa, because um, obviously New Jersey, northern New Jersey is, is much more urban. Um, and so, we, you know, that would be a good, a good place to start. For us, it's, it's actually the complete opposite, right? And, and, uh, and it's partially because of the Economic Development Authority and one of the incentive bills that, that I authored and we're doing a cleanup version tomorrow on the Senate floor was to incentivize companies to come into urban centers where they would not have necessarily thought of opening. So, and even when I think about the old suburban sprawling campuses for industry, They've also taken initiatives either to go hybrid and come into places like Jersey City, Bayonne, um, Newark, uh, and it, for many reasons, right? It's We're 15 minutes, 20 minutes of a direct train ride into Manhattan. Uh, you can get on a airlift and, um, you know, the AirTran and, and uh, get to the airport in 15 minutes and then fly to Germany. So within 10 hours, someone could be in downtown North and then have a meeting with all of you. I mean, so they're recognizing these kind of advantages. Our growth has predominantly shifted to urban core centers. And that was specifically designed because areas like the city of Newark had not seen corporations coming to and navigating. And so we were doing it from several perspectives. How do we build our downtown neighborhoods? How do we then require a corporate responsibility sense to lift our uh, families who live around these downtown quarters who are some of the poorest in the state and create programming that connects our students or our uh, work base to an apprenticeship program. So not only are you opening a company, we're also going to hire from the immediate area, you're going to purchase from the immediate area and try to create a whole kind of like investment infrastructure right within that one dynamic. The huge difference in the state in urban and suburban is exactly what I think some of the other speakers had said, um, that there isn't much industry in, in, in rural areas. How do we do that? So when I think about um, uh, what Stormy had asked, we are just going to engage in a huge wind project here in, in New Jersey, but it's not going to be necessarily in rural areas. It'll be down in South Jersey on our beach corridor lines, which I'm, I wouldn't necessarily consider them the rural front of New Jersey. Our rural front is in dire need of making sure that they have access to corridors for, for transportation. And I think if we focus on that, then if someone is on a train for an hour and a half or two, you can get to places of work and employment. The other thing is the underlying current of who lives in these two areas, right? Um, when I even think about uh, SNAP benefits in the state are is, is food assistance programs. And when I think about our food assistance programs in our schools, applications for free and reduced lunch, lunches in urban areas is always at, at a high percentage. People apply and they participate. Our urban areas would qualify for all of these program, programs, but I think there is this um, not this unwillingness to, to kind of classify or brand themselves in need of these programs. And so really meet, lose out on some um, resources that would be made available to them. But, you know, two focuses. Our growth is not in the suburban areas. Our growth is happening in the urban areas and our divide from urban and suburban really lies on infrastructure in the sense that, you know, we have to lay down, you know, a bus is, is, is a good thing and it's necessary, but we have to lay down tracks for either, you know, some kind of a, uh, you know, train mechanism to connect families from one quarter of the state to the other. Thank you. Ellen, what, what about you? What's the situation in Rhineland-Palatinate? Hmm. We have many suburban areas um, around our bigger cities and metropolitan areas like Frankfurt, Cologne, that are not inside of Rhineland-Palatinate, but uh, right outside the borders of our neighbor states. Um, for us, it's really important, and I'd like to tackle an issue we have not talked about today, to have universities close by in these suburban areas, um, so that we have an infrastructure that young is attractive for young people. We lose our universities, we would lose our, um, um, our um, um, yeah, younger potential, and also um, 
um, we need a startup system and environment there to uh, rebuild young innovative companies and uh, economic infrastructure that is, will be crucial um, for the development of my state. If we lose all this modern infrastructure, um, all the young people would uh, go to the cities and in the cities um, there are no affordable housing, uh, there's no affordable housing, so they need to come back to suburban areas, but if they are not attractive in living, um, yeah, the gap is really big um, to, to fill. Um, as well, I'd like to take on another issue, issue we have not talked about today, but it's, that's really important to me. We have talked about infrastructure a lot today, but there is a political dimension of, of rural um, and urban divide. And we see, um, Theresa, Theresa tackled that issue. Um, if, when we see the people that live in, in suburban areas, um, there are um, younger uh, till middle old people that had, are open minded and are political center in, in the center. But when it comes um, to rural areas in Germany, um, you can see that in my state, um, we have a quite conservative um, population that is in the middle of democracy. But when we look at Philip's state, for instance, you can see that. He said already, and maybe you can go into detail, because I think that's an interesting point, um, that a lot of younger innovative people left your country and your, your state and went to Berlin and other big cities already. And that might have that as well if we do not fight against it and build an environment with universities and a younger culture uh, that sticks together and keeps work in, in the state. And otherwise, yeah, we have then an environment where people live that vote for yeah, very left-wing parties. And that becomes a bigger issue all over Europe when it comes to rural urban. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you also for, for underscoring that political dimension, because I think that that's extremely important um, as we look at the political landscape, obviously here in the US, where we're seeing a deep divide in the way that people vote, um, but also with the upcoming election in Germany, as think people are thinking about different demographics in different parts of society. But that's a perfect segue to, to Philip to talk a little bit about um, the brain drain and, and what's going on in mecklenburg Um Over to you. Yes, I. Uh, in, in the meantime, I tried to look which are suburban areas in mecklenburg vorpommern uh, because we only have two really big cities. It's Rostock with 200,000 inhabitants and Schwerin with 100,000, so uh, there is a big, uh, yeah, a big part of like where nothing rural and real, so we have only suburban areas uh, all over the country, and we only have two universities. And um, some, I don't know whether I, I find the, the real American but, uh, name. Uh, we have not universities but higher schools uh, where you can also make uh, something. It's like Fachhochschule in Germany. And, community uh, colleges. Community colleges, okay. And because of this uh, low um, options for the younger people, they go after the school, they go to the big cities, to the, uh, to the universities, but I, now I think they, they come back when they are like 30, when they want to have families, when they find um, the rural areas of the country as uh, really uh, family friendly, when they say, okay, here they get something like schools, something uh, like uh, kindergarten and so on, and they can uh, come here and uh, live and have all the options uh, they want to have uh, to have a good life. And that's a little bit um, tricky because uh, when, we, when we look around um, in, in the big city like Rostock, Ro Rostock is like half an hour from here, we have a train, we have uh, also a highway to come there, but uh, for the people in, in, in Rostock, it's like, uh, no, okay, we don't want to go to uh, Gusto or the other cities, it's a little bit too far away. Um, but now we want to, uh, we, we try to bring the companies to, uh, to the side because in the big cities, we have something like startup um, um, center at the university, at the community colleges. We want to um, get the ideas of this it's in, in, in the big cities in, in, in Berlin, it's like Beta House and all the other uh, companies who want to try like incubator and, and so forth, the companies, we doesn't have this years ago. Now we are trying to build this 
to um, hold the people here because all the startups uh, uh, they, they were going to the big cities in the last years. So we have they have to, uh, they, they haven't any options here to grow. Thank you, Philip. Um, Jerry, um, I guess the, the, you know, I want to give you an opportunity to, to respond um, to this as well. But um, in the chat, a couple of people have raised healthcare and, and healthcare access as a topic as well, which is the, the closing question that I wanted to pose to all of you. So um, I wanted to, to do maybe two things. One is to, you know, think a little bit about um, you know, this, this issue, but then also um, ask about access to healthcare. Obviously, the pandemic revealed great shortcomings um, in the healthcare infrastructure. Um, and this has been a big challenge, particularly for, for rural areas in the United States. Um, can you talk a little bit about whether there are any lessons that people have learned as we come out of, out of this, this crisis? Uh, I think there are a ton of lessons we've learned, and I actually think there's probably still lessons to be learned. Uh, if we talk about healthcare and, and understand that my rural uh, my rural perception is probably much different than what I'm hearing from even the other uh, rural legislators. Uh, understand that. Uh, uh, I live out where my closest neighbor is a mile from me, or that'd be what, two and a half uh, kilometers uh, is the next nearest house I live, uh, which one of the largest areas or towns in my district has a population of 12,000. It's been that 12,000 uh, since uh, I grew up here. So uh, these when we talk about rural areas and then you talk about the suburban areas, uh, I, I view those suburban areas as metro, as, as urban, even though they're uh, 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 suburbs of actually a major city. When it comes to healthcare out here, uh, it becomes a, a huge challenge. Uh, parts of my district, you can go uh, 50, 60, uh, 70, 80 miles, uh, that would be what, 200, 250 kilometers without having a hospital, having access to a hospital or some sort of care if you need emergency. So if, uh, if you have chest pains or you have a farm accident, uh, you're a long ways from health care. Uh, we, we typically drive uh, two hours uh, to a specialist uh, for our elderly, the heart specialist, or, or uh, you know, some sort of specialist to deal with the, the elderly population in our district. Uh, that is a huge challenge. We had hoped that telemedicine would help that. Uh, but as we get into that telemedicine, it goes back to the conversation about the infrastructure on broadband and, and, and being able to have those uh, type of assets to be able to be helpful uh, within the healthcare arena. So healthcare is a struggle out in uh, rural areas of the state. Access to uh, uh, pharmacies is a struggle. Uh, most insurance companies want you to do mail order, which actually drives our local pharmacies out of business because they no longer have the ability to sell all the drugs uh, and, and so that when, when your kid or grandkid has an ear infection that you need antibiotics, all of a sudden you're 50, 60 miles away or 150 kilometers away from a pharmacy to get them antibiotics. So healthcare is a struggle uh, and, and I think is one of the biggest issues in the uh, urban rural divide. But I guess let me, I mean, identifying it as the challenge um, is often you know, part of the battle, but I guess the, the question there is, are there solutions that are being discussed at the state level in terms of trying to, to address this? Um, I you know, agree with you completely. There had been great hope about 
telemedicine. Obviously, that doesn't help in an emergency situation. Um, if somebody's had a farm accident or somebody's broken a limb, uh, one needs a facility to take care of that. But as you say, um, telemedicine doesn't work if you don't have the broadband. So are there measures that are being taken in, in Colorado at the state level um, to, to move forward on this? Uh, yes, uh, we continue to throw money at the problem. Uh, I'm not sure that's solely the answer. We've been working on this broadband issue. Uh, I've been working on it for 10 years uh, in the legislature. And uh, it, it's tough to get people engaged, uh, companies engaged uh, in, in rural areas of the state when it's not near as profitable, when they can go to those suburbs, uh, expand that uh, rural, uh, uh, that broadband access, uh, and it's the same with the, uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, what hospital wants to set up shop in a, in a community, the largest community uh, in my region that has 12,000 population when you're going to have trouble uh, uh, getting doctors to come out here? Uh, you know, they, they spend, uh, what, a quarter million dollars on an education and have uh, uh, loans to pay back. Uh, we have done things to help forgive loans, uh, to get enticed doctors uh, to come to rural Colorado. We do the same thing with businesses for broadband. Uh, are they working? Uh, maybe to a small extent, uh, but we have seen, a, uh, seen that highlighted through the pandemic that we need to do more. Thank you, Jerry. Teresa, you were nodding your head as, as Jerry was speaking. Um, do, you, do you have anything to add? And, and what's the, the situation in New Jersey when it comes to access to healthcare? So I, I can't speak from a, from a rural lens. I can only speak the, from the urban lens, where, which where I live. For us here, it's uh, so not access to hospitals themselves, right? Within distance you can get to it it would be the infrastructure of the hospital where the emergency rooms probably have to get you know bigger and better and stronger we do have a premier tier one hospital here that is going to be undergoing a major overhaul with some of the initiatives in this budget and i think with the infrastructure money that's coming to for us it's more accessibility to general practitioners kind of like what jerry was saying is that um, the brain drain here also exists in the medical field. People may get their, their degrees in the state of New Jersey, but they move out because the Medicaid reimbursement is, is, is very low. And so it's not profitable to stay in certain areas. So when I think about the general practitioners in my neighborhood, it's, it's very few and often waiting rooms that are overflowing because it's, it's probably the only person that speaks the language of the people who are visiting. And the other big thing is just having access to insurance. I have a demographic that many are not covered. And so I can't even think about accessibility to healthcare when the first step in connecting someone to a doctor's office is being able to afford it and pay for it. And that, that there is a missing um, a variable in that equation. Obviously, in Germany, the insurance issue is is it's covered. Not it's something that I know. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a non starter. It's, mandatory. it's a common sense thing that everyone should do, but somehow we lose sight of that. That if we make investment in people's health, that the outcomes would be much better. So, but I think we are moving forward. Um, this bill does uh, expand our child state child care insurance program, and it includes undocumented children, and so. So at least we'll be covering a whole other uh, base of a population that didn't necessarily have the, the financial means to get to, to our facilities. And in, in many senses, coverage and access are two sides of the same coin, particularly mm -hmm. here in the, in the US. Um, so Ellen and, and Philip, as, as we begin to, to wrap up here, as, as you were listening to, to Jerry and Teresa, what um, sort of resonated with you um, and what, what didn't really resonate with you as you think about uh, access to healthcare um, and healthcare infrastructure in each of your states, um, particularly in some of the, the less densely populated areas where um, there might not be a hospital close by and where there might not be access? Ellen, perhaps you first, and then and then we'll give Philip the last word. <laughs> yeah, I want. Uh, I'm always first. I uh, wanted to have Philip on the floor, but oh, no, we, never we mind. Can, we can. Anyway, um, 
um, in my in my state, um, it's a multi multi dimensional problem. Um, uh, we have uh, we have uh, affordability of healthcare, as you said, is not a problem in Germany. So everyone is covered in our healthcare security system, uh, insured, and has access to healthcare. If we had enough hospitals, and if of course had enough doctors around, um, which is more or less the case in the countryside, we have hospitals, and we try to keep them. Uh, the infrastructure of our hospitals, um, it's not as uh, they are not as far away as they are in Colorado, they are quite close by, but um, we are lacking of doctors and nurses to work there. Um, that's the other dimension of our problem. We um, have the hospitals, but um, for, um, for bigger uh, surgeries, you would go to a specified hospital. So in the smaller hospitals, you only go for an emergency or to give birth or, yeah, minor um, minor issues um, in other in all other cases you would go to the bigger hospitals anyway and therefore uh, financing the small hospitals when they have no high costs um, due to big um, surgeries they they have a, a financial problem and that's one dimension of the problem so it, we have to put a lot of state money into these hospitals to keep the infrastructure alive um, and then on the other side as i already mentioned um, is the staff in the hospital. Young um, students in, at universities who study medicine are mainly female and female doctors do not want to work in the countryside. They want to stay in urban areas where the infrastructure of childcare is better, where um, they have better working times. Um, they do not want in the work in the countryside overnight, late in the evening, over the weekends, um, as doctors with their own responsibilities to look all after all these, um, yeah, these invoices and all that bureaucratic stuff um, involved. And therefore, we have a big problem recruiting enough doctors for the countryside. And then again, um, nurses for the hospitals as um, they are not well paid in Germany. I think that's the same problem, of course, in the US. And we have young people, we have not many young people that want to become nurses anymore um, due to its hard work, uh, long working hours overnight, over Christmas at the weekends, and nobody wants to do it anymore. We have a lack of, um, yeah, we, young people in Germany can work on the labor market where they want in much better paid jobs with better working times and therefore these are the two dimensions we have to fight against and um, the solutions are not easy to find. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ellen. Let me give the last word to Philip. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ellen also said we have, um, well, every German has uh, healthcare services, so we have um, a system built on this and we have now a little problem with the uh, small hospitals. Um, they are um, not so far away like Jerry. And when I uh, um, hear to Jerry, it's, uh, I, I, I think I have to class classify all my country as suburban because uh, we have uh, like half an hour or 40 minutes as a way to a hospital. Um, and it's not so far away, like two hours. And it's uh, really risky, I think, when I think about uh, mecklenburg vorpommern And we also discussed about hospitals and how we can hold them. Because um, actually, we discussed about a minimum quantity. So uh, a minimum among of services a hospital has to do uh, to um, get funding in this, um, in this area. And if you don't have so many babies uh, born or something like this, uh, um, healthcare services or the healthcare companies say you uh, you you will you won't get any money for this because you don't have the quality of this. But you only can have the quality if you have like 500 uh, births or so. And so now we discuss about the quantity and the quality of hospitals and uh, how can a hospital stay in the rural area when they don't have so much uh, people who are going there. Um, we also try to make some digital uh, new things. Uh, it's like the um, video, the, the doctor video, the, the video consultation where you can, um, yeah, um, 
have a first look on something so maybe you can um, stop the way to the doctor we have equipped uh, some ambulances with videos so the doctor can be connected directly to the amb ambulance on the way to the hospital so they can help uh, on the, pe the people on on the um, on the ambulance uh, and uh, at the same time, we have rural regions where some are closer to the border with Poland. Uh, so we are in the process of setting an agreement with uh, the po with Poland that ambulances can uh, used on both sides of the border. It's much more complicated than anyone uh, think about uh, cross border ambulances. And one of the biggest uh, difficulties is, uh, with this cross-border is uh, are the cross-border helicopters uh, because it uh, doesn't seem to work in, in no way uh, like uh, flying a little bit on the other side of the border and helping someone because mostly we have the um, helicopters to transport the doctors. And um, Alan is right, we have a big problem to get um, doctors from the university, people who want to study uh, medicine, and uh, they don't want to go in the rural areas. We have a new uh, law, like uh, you will get um, um, study and in, in place in the, in the university for medicine um, much easier, a little bit easier, when you um, make an agreement that you go in the rural area after your study, uh, when you're finished. Um, otherwise, you have to pay um, a big uh, among um, to get out of this agreement, um, that's one way to get the people in the in the rural area. But um, many young people don't want to work all over the uh, all over the day. So we have in the hospitals a little problem. The people want to be flexible. They want to um, have family. They want to have eight to five work, and uh, it should be a little bit easier. And uh, that's some problems we have with the healthcare system now. So the people. Um, yeah, I'm not all over the time um, able to work at the hospital, and it's also it's not, not only the doctors, also the nurses. Uh, they don't want to work in the night and um, around all around the day. Well, thank you, thank you for that. I I want to end by just sending a heartfelt thanks to the four of you for this fantastic discussion. Uh, one of our viewers wrote, quote, this was awesome, exclamation mark, and I can only underscore that. This has been a great discussion. Uh, it's been fantastic to weave together some of these key issues, education, healthcare, infrastructure. They're of critical importance in both of our countries, um, both in dense urban areas and in less populated rural areas and everything in between. And you've helped shed some light on what some of the challenges are and what some of the top priorities are. So I'd like to thank the four of you for this interesting and engaging conversation. I'd like to thank our viewers for weighing in with questions and comments. And Stormy, I will give you the absolute last word um, of this session to, to bring us to a close. Also very many thanks from my side. I learned a lot um, and I have a much more differentiated view now. I learned that there is a lack in infrastructure in all of our countries and districts that infrastructure needs to be defined more broadly, not just in terms of roads, but also education, health, energy. Um, I also learned that um, the um, urban rural divide cannot be fixed by just looking at one policy issue, but it needs to be comprehensive um, and interconnected approach. And we need to get out of our silo thinking and policy making. And last but not least, I also learned is um, we shall not forget about the inner cities. Um, that is also an issue which we have to address. Um, so I take away lots of learnings. Um, thank you so much for this, uh, this debate today. I hope to see many of you next time we meet, um, which should be after the summer break, um, and we are already planning um, our next event. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers, our participants, our partners, and all our colleagues who made this possible today. So back to you, Steve. Goodbye. That was the last word. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Um, this was great. Thank you. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Bye bye. Next time, next time, Steve, we should meet in Germany. Okay. <laughs> You're on. We'll be in touch about that. Bye, everyone. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.